Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank MEA for inviting me to moderate this very interesting session. Uh, since I'm only going to moderate, I didn't think it was nice for me to go up there and, and, and say something and leave that platform to the speakers. Uh, let me first introduce the uh, speakers. All three are illustrious uh, performers. Um, the first in the list that I've got is uh, Dato Elizabeth Lee. Um, she's a graduate of Cambridge University uh, in the field of education. And of course, uh, recently she got a uh, very commendable award uh, in education, a global award. And in the interest of time, I think I'll just say that much. She's got so many accolades. <laughs> now, the second person that I'll introduce, um, uh, she's a young professor, Nora Manaf. Um, she's got several roles too. She's currently a group chief human capital officer um, and a member of the group Exco Bank of, of Maybank. She's, um, even before she came here, although I didn't see, didn't know the person, now I can put the person to the, to the details that I've got before. She's a very accomplished accountant, um, and very much in demand in relation to uh, the field of accountancy. <laughs> Now, the third speaker here is from the World Bank. He's the lead economist, macroeconomic trade and investment global practice, uh, Dr. Richard Record. Nice surname we've got. Um, well, um, we have a World Bank office here. You hear all three of them speaking about talent development, which is an important component of economic progress, uh, depending on which side of the coin you are. That there are those who believe that so long as you focus on producing large numbers of human capital, if you're competent, that's it, you can drive um, in the mold of how uh, Paul Romer, um, Bob Lucas and other use human capital. But then of course there's the other side that discusses the tacit element related to, to human capital development. It's not just enough to acquire these qualifications. Uh, it's just like you can watch Beckham kicking his free kick. Well, a thousand times you try, a thousand times it may not happen though. <laughs> Uh, this is how uh, uh, Michael Poliani first um, advanced the notion of tacit as opposed to experiential that was actually articulated by Eddie Penrose. Now, I'm sure that the speakers will talk about what has evolved since. Uh, and I, I hear and I see here, we've had several sessions that have been very interesting in the field of Industry 4.0. Um, it's not just about talking about artificial intelligence, transference and intelligence of smart robots and and drones, uh, it's not just about using big data analytics. How do you create an infrastructure where everyone becomes active as participants in the process of, on the one hand, appropriating, and the other hand, uh, um, performing uh, two different aspects of a public good, which is non exploitable and non revolutionary uh, It's not just enough to expose, but it's also how individuals, as, as economic agents, are able to appropriate such synergies. Now, with that, I will pass the cue to the first speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Elizabeth. Uh, 15 minutes, please. Our distinguished professor, uh, Dr. Raja Rasia, who is so well known as our foremost economist, one of our foremost economists in, uh, in Malaysia, um, earlier on at uh, Coffee, he told me, oh, I only just had a PhD in, in economics. I said, oh my God, I don't even know what I'm doing on this panel because I'm just a simple teacher. And, uh, and here I am being invited to speak on, econ on the economy. So I'm a little bit um, worried, especially when we have a lead economist right on the other end, which is um, uh, Dr. Richard R Record himself. And of course, my very uh, dear friend, uh, she's now adjunct professor. Um, Nora Manaf, who is none other than a group chief capital, uh, human capital officer of Maybank. So I shall try, ladies and gentlemen, especially after your lunch. So I am looking at uh, your theme, Malaysian Economic Convention 2019, and you're talking about Malaysia in reform. Um, and uh, so... Everyone is talking about reform, but I would like to approach it from a education point of view, right? Nelson Mandela said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And the thing is, every time we have a change in 
Don't talk about even government, change in ministers. Government is even more, more drastic. Uh, they always want to change, especially education. And uh, you can imagine our education minister always in the limelight and how much pressure he has because it's always felt that with change, it's always with education. So my question now is, um, what about this change? And I'd like to approach it uh, through the five C's, because after all, um, education is like diamonds to us. Change is the first of the C's. What is change? When you talk about reform, it talks about um, making an improvement, especially for changing a person's behavior or the structure or something. Now, I want to concentrate on this part about changing a person's behavior. And then you will, might want to ask yourself whether, therefore, changing things like um, uh, acts and education reform in a macro sense will make sense at all. If you look at the, uh, our Malaysian education system, reforms have occurred many times throughout the last half decade. And the policies that have gone to make up the education system and its contents are actually found in several government reports. And let me just uh, name some of these. In 1951, we have something known as the Barnes Report. Then we have the Fen Yu Report. Uh, we have the Razak Report in 1956. And then in 1960, we have the Rahman Talib Report. And in 1967, we had the Higher Education Committee Report. Now that, we are getting serious. And in 1973, Committee Reports on Study Views on Education and Society. This is the Dropout Report. Uh, then in 1979, we had um, Cabinet Committee Reports on Review of Implementation of Education Policies, also known as the Mahathil Report. So you can see the eras changing according to the to not so much the Prime Minister then, but to the Education Minister. And then Cabinet Committee Report on Training, etc. We go on to the 2000s and, and we have the education. And before that, in 1996, that was a very um, milestone year. That was when Najib took over as the Education Minister and we had our six what are these six acts? The Education Act of uh, 555, uh, 550, and then for me, it's ingrained in our heads, Act 555, which is actually, for the very first time, the Private Higher Education Institution Act. And then we also have the National Council of Higher Education Act, the MQA Act. Um, it started as the Lembaga Accreditasi National, and then it was uh, replaced in... Uh, 2007 by the MQA Act, and of course the AUKA, uh, which was amended, and it's now actually under review, and the PTPTN Act in 1997. Following that, we have also had um, education development plans uh, for 2001 to 2010, and the National Higher Education Strategic Plans, in 2009, we have strengthening of private education in Malaysia by the Economic Planning Unit. And, and, and now in the two, 2013, we had our first Malaysian Education Blueprint. Let me just show you this. Um, and this was for preschool and post-secondary education where they actually identified 11 shifts for transformation. Um, and then later, let me just show you what these shifts are. And they, they are very, I, I like this because I think a lot of thought has gone into it and it is still very relevant. Shift one, provide equal access to quality education of an international standard. Shift two, ensure every child is proficient in Bahasa, both Malaysia and English, and is encouraged to learn an additional language as well. Shift three is to de develop values-driven Malaysians. Shift four, transform teaching into the profession of choice. Shift five, ensure high-performing school learners in every school. Shift six, 
uh, empower JPNs, PPDs, and schools to customize solutions based on need. And then shift seven, uh, this is leveraging on ICT. Shift eight is actually to transform the ministry. And shift nine, to partner with parents, community, and private sector. And shift 10 is to maximize student outcomes. So this is, we're beginning to talk about student outcomes. And shift 11 is to increase transparency. So that was as recent as 2013. And it was followed in two years later by the um, Malaysia Education Blueprint for Higher Education. Now, this blueprint, which has 10 shifts, and I'm not necessarily going to go around it because they are all, as you can see from the slide, uh, they are basically ensuring a very well-rounded education and preparing our young people for the future. And they have um, certain aspirations uh, which have been mapped up, these being to ensure that there's um, equal access, quality, of course, equity, unity, and efficiency. So, and this blueprint is supposed to lead us all the way to 2025. So, what are we talking about change? We've got all these reforms in place already. We've got all, all acts that are being reviewed, that needs to be reviewed. Actually, when you look at this picture that was drawn up, talking about change in the Malaysia higher education, you will see that we have actually changed quite a fair bit from my higher education 1.0 to where we are today, which is my higher education uh, 4.0, from being very teacher-centered, where you just basically soak in everything the teacher tells you, teacher is God. And then... Uh, Education, higher education 2.0, we are still regurgitating our facts, we're still responding rather than thinking for ourselves, to uh, higher education 3.0, where it's becoming more collaborative, where we talk about teamwork. And now, in education, higher education 4.0, where we bring in all the ICT, the digital learning, etc., but very often, when I look at that picture, I actually am very worried that we haven't actually moved very far from higher education 3.0. Are we really doing this um, collaboration? We change our classrooms, definitely, uh, so that students face each other rather than all facing the classrooms. That is in some of the pro more progressive institutions and schools. However, many a times, it's still very lecture-oriented. And um, I remember when I was in university, and this is as far back as, my goodness now, um, 30 over years ago, can you believe that? And um, it was specifically told to me, uh, I think Professor Raja Rasia will know this, where we are told at university that um, lectures are not compulsory. You don't have to come for lectures. In fact, you can stay back, stay home, stay back in your hostel. However, Supervision is very important. Tutorials are very important. You don't come, you die. Literally. Because the whole idea is that you have this interaction with others in your little group and you learn from each other. But whether we in Malaysia has actually changed from higher education 3.0 um, to, or rather to higher education 3.0 or even move on to higher education 4.0. So let's talk about um, the school system. Just now, I named five Cs. The second C is actually what, we, uh, what I've called coaches. Really, at the end of the day, why are we not changing? When we go back to the classroom, who will be responsible for making any change? The teachers, right? The very coaches. So the teachers themselves, are they willing to change? Are they willing to dismantle the whole system whereby they are looked up to as God? Or where, are, where they do the teaching in and out to something where they let it go free and allow the students to ask all kinds of questions, questions that you and I may not be able to answer. So the, 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 um, the problem could very well be in actually in our uh, school system itself. 
It was once said that maybe it is because we pay the teachers um, a raw deal. After all, if you, uh, you, know, you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. That's that famous saying, you know, and uh, that we don't pay our teachers so much. Uh, so I did ask um, um, Bing Lian, who, who was working with me on this, and I said, can you go and check on the teachers' salaries nowadays? How bad is it? Because I remember in the old days, especially when I started, it was pretty bad. Then she said, uh, it's not too bad because they actually start at uh, 2,000 uh, basic nowadays, and uh, you can get a uh, double, double, double um, increment. So it has come up to quite a fair bit. Um, but then, you know, that people always say it is a half day's job and they can make a lot more when they go home and they give tuition. But then that is a problem because that shouldn't be the case. Definitely when I was a student uh, at university again, I look at my, fa my, my, my counterparts from Singapore. Uh, they were on a government scholarship. And the best of the students were actually channeled not into medicine, but they were channeled all into teaching. So they were choosing their very best, sending them to top universities like Cambridge and putting them in to become eventual teachers. And when I went to look at the Singapore schools, it was not half day. It was a full day. The teachers start from early morning and they worked all the way to the evening. So the whole attitude is very different. And of course then, this idea of uh, whether you provide the conditions in which the students can learn, which is what um, Albert Einstein is talking about. So with, with the teachers, um, the pay. What about the stigma? In Malaysia, it's not seen as the preferred choice. You know, that there's even this saying, uh, if you can't do anything anymore, then by all means go and teach, which is really unfair because teaching is such a great responsibility. You entrust your whole future of Malaysia unto the teacher's hands, but if you don't put the best in place, then where are we going? Right? Um, I asked for this picture to be put in. Ladies and gentlemen, what is wrong with this picture? What is wrong with this picture? Come on, what is wrong with this picture? Do you see anything wrong with it? I think this is biasa, normal, natural. The hat, right? The sun is in his face. Why did he put the cap behind? You know, and then he put his hand like that, you know, to see. But you know, this is an acid test. I have asked many people, and there are many people like this out there. They put the cap this way because they, yes, we have argued about this. We had debates. They were taught as baseball players that they must put it behind because they've got to put a, a mask in front of their face. Yeah, fine and well, but you're not playing baseball now. You're actually watching the game. You know? And, um, and maybe it's the fashion. So we follow the fashion, you know, unthinkingly. But the, but the whole point of that is Ladies and gentlemen, I come to my next C. Are we really teaching common sense in schools, in education? You know, I, I was so frustrated. I talked to my human resources chief back in Sunway. I said, some of these things, are, can you please go and, you know, every time we think training will help it all. And so we asked them, yeah. We keep asking them, can you go and, 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 and train? And she turned around, you, you know, uh, you cannot train common sense, you know. So that's my next C. Okay? And uh, I, I just, I'm going to close up because uh, my, my moderator tells me so. Uh, but Sir, Sir Ken Robinson is someone that I really love. And uh, he, he talked about the need to unlearn, to relearn. Because we are all into road learning nowadays. And, uh, and so the point with this is that maybe when we talk about education and reform, it's not talking about the great acts. We're not talking about ministers. Stop harping on the minister, black shoes, white shoes or whatever. Ourselves, deep down inside us, we need to change. Let's start with ourselves, you know. And 
and how we we look at people you know oh, the IQ so good um, so high and all that but really is it about IQ and this is my last slide IQ versus EQ versus SQ what the competencies my last C is needed now are really for tomorrow's needs are the list that I have there and when you look at it it's really about common sense and otherwise as I told my people, if you continue the way that you are, then I would eventually have to replace you by robots. Because in the digital age, and we talk about being in education, having to future-proof our graduates, having to, keep, to teach them, uh, having to equip them with skills for tomorrow. But at the end of the day, we also need to ask my, uh, ourselves, as I ask myself, whether we, our curriculum that we have prescribed, which is also another C, is adequate. Maybe the curriculum should be concentrating on these competencies that you see before you. There is one more slide, which is the last one. And this sums up with the people we need for tomorrow. People who are risk takers, people who know how to trust each other and don't just learn on their own. There should not be any exams, agility, flexibility, teamwork, and the power and ability to anticipate the next move. So on that, am I on time? Thank you very much. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to mention a few things about the presentation just now. She discussed the policies we have had in place in Malaysia uh, to promote education. Uh, one thing I think, um, I'm not sure how she presented it, but if you look at the Majid report and subsequently carried by the Radha report, uh, we're supposed to have a breakdown by 1990, um, STEM courses amounting to 60% of overall education. Um, but we now have a situation where 70% non-science courses, uh, and therefore uh, the 70% has little to do with science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine, the STEM courses. Um, and in that sense, I think, uh, although she subsequently addressed the issue of the kind of competence one needs to have and, and the, um, the um, respect teachers must hold, um, I suppose we will hear from the other speakers at least something to do with talent that we're bringing back. Um, we have national talent discussed at length. Um, maybe the other speakers will allude to that. Now, because she made this point about me having done econo only economics for my PhD, I did a first degree in business management because uh, in non-science people thought that was a great field from 78 to 82. Um, I specialized in both accounting and operations management um, and therefore I didn't do economics at the time. So just to put that into context. Now let's hear from the next speaker, um, a young professor, Nora, please. I hope we can, we can keep to the time so that we can uh, have more questions. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Raja and uh, Dr. Elizabeth for acknowledging me. Now, I will not pretend to be an economist, and I am not, right? but I am very sure that you've spent more than one and a half days going through the data and the statistics, um, yeah, and, and you've had your fill of it, and you're thinking about what next, because that's, that's why we come to these sessions, right? It's about um, you know, taking some time out and recalibrating and getting new information or reviewing um, information that you've already got but not quite used enough. And that's an a IR 4.0 skill, really, right? Uh, analytics and using big data um, and, and using data to, to decide uh, your next steps. Right, But in a nutshell, and I, I still need to do a bit of context setting before I go on the talent part, Dr. Raja, um, the, you would have seen the data saying global GDP growth is going through a slow growth period, right? Okay. Um, however, I have to say this quickly before it's... Um, you know, used out of context. However, it will not, we will not fall into recession, right? 
ASEAN countries, and again, I assume you would have seen the data, um, you know, not very exciting, although there are some countries in ASEAN would have a better growth uh, projection in 2019-2020, but Malaysia is, is still going to be a flat growth, right? So that's the one angle of the context. The other angle um, is the question on what's enough for an individual, for a human being, to be able to sustain a fair you know, living condition and, and um, uh, income, right? Uh, what's, what's reasonable? And you would have read, you would have talked about, you would have discussed, um, for example, one, one um, reference is the Bainagara release, right? Uh, what, 4,500 would be um, the expected income to be able to, for a couple without, a, without children to be able to sustain a, a good enough living condition, um, or a single person, uh, unmarried, would require about 2,500. What's our minimum wage right now? Hmm? What's the country's minimum wage right now? It's half. It's, it's half of, yeah, 1,100. It's half, about half of the what's said to be what's required by a single person. So, this is a very big puzzle, isn't it? Right? So companies and, and economies are not seeing that moonshot uh, uh, exponential growth. And yet, on the other hand, we, you know, being reasonable human beings and owners, I don't know if there are SME, you know, um, uh, owners here, but even multinationals, I mean, every person I speak to would, 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 would say to me, yeah, of course, if I can afford it, I want to pay my people as high as I, as I can. Right? So let's look at that puzzle. Now, I thought about what would be useful for, for me to speak on uh, in this particular forum, and I landed on just two points with that context that I just laid. Okay? Um, the first angle, the first point I, I want to make is that the structural reforms that you and I are seeing are there any, so my question is, are there any that stand out as very different from what we've seen before? No, right? I see at least two heads going, <laughs> right? So what, what did Einstein say <laughs> about pursuing the same things over and over? Huh? We're insane, right? Insanity, thank you. Yeah. Are we insane? Expecting exponential, you know, significant differences, and yet we're doing the same things. We, we just probably name it differently, right? Uh, refine a little. The principles are absolutely the same. So my point that I'd like to put to you uh, as you do your reflection is we need to do really different things. Preserving principles but looking at different approaches. Now, let me give you an example. And I'll tell you why, this ex why I'm sharing this example before you go, what? Where is she coming from? Now, I I'll tell you about my hairdresser. <laughs> right? Now, you know hairdressers and, and the person that the person you know, sees to has a very special relationship. Okay? And so I know my hairdresser's personal life, okay? And I know that she was, she was, right? She was going through a very hard life, um, a very challenging time. She, they've got, you know, she and her husband's got children. Her husband is a lorry driver. And, um, you know, they only get paid for, you know, the, the drives that they take. And, you know, it, when they don't have jobs, they don't have income. And it was destroying their, their marriage, right? Because he was losing steadily losing his confidence, yeah? 
um, as supposedly the breadwinner and his, you know, him having to depend on her and, and so forth. And he was hardly ever at home. Okay? Because he, he, he tries to, to, to go on these on this, um, drives, if you like, and deliveries, and, and it's like 24 by 7 kind of thing. So it was steadily destroying their relationship and, and their family. You know, I, one day, you know, not, not, not a brilliant thing that you know, came to my mind, but I just, I just asked her, I said, oh, your husband's a driver. Has he tried, and that time it was still um, Uber, have you, has he tried Uber? And she said, oh, really? Is, is that an option? So she started doing her research and whatnot, and her husband. And um, to cut the story short, he is now a full-time Grab driver. So, you know, move to Grab, right? Um, he's doing really well. He's getting paid more than when he had that permanent job as that lorry driver. And, you know, their relationship strengthened. Um, you, know, she, they, you know, their family's happy because dad gets to choose, because mom doesn't get, quite get to choose the time that she can, you know, take, take off from work, right? So dad has that option, and dad's more engaged. Dad's more interested in the family. Now, why am I sharing this example? Number one, the theme of this session, right? Um, MEC 2019, Malaysian Reform, Good Governance and Regulation. Good governance. Governance needs to come in different forms today. If you and I are using old you know, mindsets and old mentalities in terms of what is good governance, We'll be in trouble, right? Uber just, you know, blazed through. Did Uber ask for permission? No, they didn't. I remember when, when, they, were, when they were first, you know, starting in the different countries. London had a, a standstill, right? The, the whole city was, was uh, um, uh, in chaos when, when the, the drivers, the black cab drivers were on the streets, right? Protesting against them. Indonesia, I was in Jakarta when uh, the drivers there decided they were going to, to, to demonstrate that Friday. And I got the hell out of, excuse my French, out of Jakarta because the traffic jam would be, have been crazy, right? So everybody was against it and yet it thrived. And the model is, is a successful one, right? And, and Grab's um, is successful uh, you, leveraging on that model. Now, so... When, uh, you know, it has now, we today have all these new solutions and tools at our disposal. Are we using them? This family that I spoke on, right? Just the fact that in, well, initially, it never occurred to them that being an Uber driver or a Grab driver is an option. Why? Because society would have looked at that as him still being a bum, right? No permanent job means bum, right? Irresponsible. So the mentality that needs to be changed is we talk about gig economy. I could have, you know, or gig workforce. I could just give you theories and, you know, surveys and research on, on where gig workforce is. But I don't want to do that because I want to talk about practical stuff here. And this example is a practical one, right? So now the whole family, initially the family was, was very against it, as in his parents and so forth, right? But today everybody sees how wonderful just that option of using the current tool available to mankind has opened up, you know, this, has, has enabled this family to live well and happily. Okay, and that mindset change of social of, of society to accept what's new was also required. Okay, now the other part is these changes in terms of governance as well, right? If you govern wrongly, you destroy, as in this couple that I, that you know I was trying to demonstrate, you destroy a person's dignity and confidence. So it has huge implications. Now, I will give you an example of how I transpose this to a corporate 
right? And, and to Maybank, for example. But before I do that, let me go on the second point. So do, we do need to look at different things and really try different things and understand how to govern, how to change mindsets um, to truly reflect IR 4.0 type solutions. The second point or the second angle is complete solutions. Now I worry when these reforms are done piecemeal. Okay? And again, I'm going to use a, a layman example. Many years ago, I was walking with a minister. Okay? Um, we had this CR thing. And uh, it was very early in the morning. Um, the participants were given uh, tapau breakfast. Right? And I noticed there were no garbage disposal bins. Okay? So I mentioned it to the minister. I said, where are the dustbins? Because I, I saw people just, you know, leaving their, their, their containers everywhere. And he said, oh, no, no, no. We now no, no longer provide garbage bins. And I said, uh-huh. And where are these people? Because we provide them these tapau containers. And where are they going to throw them? Right? And there was no answer. Okay? So I worry when people try to provide solutions in, in, you know, or half big solutions, if you like. The minimum wage thing that I mentioned just now, okay, um, it's a whole cycle. We cannot tackle just the minimum wage because employer federations, and I'm a council member of MEF, employers are just going to say, but we can't afford it, right? So the answer, and, and there'll be a standoff, and there is a standoff. So the answer is actually looking at it from a, again, different angle, governing it from a different angle. It's about exponential business results. And how do we do, excuse me, how do we do that? Right? We cannot solve one part of it and say, okay, I'm just going to raise it to 2,000 because that's what the data says. And then what about affordability of companies? Oh, that's a different ministry. They'll solve it. Just like my dustbin example. Okay? Another example is plastic. Whilst I am fully on board with ESG, I don't want companies to go bankrupt. Because if companies go bankrupt, people lose jobs. Right? So again, it cannot be a half big solution. So whenever you know, people say to me, oh, we no longer use plastic bottles. I see a lot of plastic bottles here, good and bad. Okay. My question to that person or that company is, have you checked what is the implication? So it's the unintended consequences. Have you checked what's happened to your vendor who probably had been providing you with the, you know, with the water bottles all these years? Has the company gone bankrupt? Have people lost jobs? That's an unintended consequence if you, again, try to you know, solve it piecemeal. Okay? So for governments and banks who have a stake in this and companies, it's about a holistic solution. Right? Now, I'm going to take three minutes to show you one video very quickly, and then we'll come back to the two points that I'm um, raising. How many minutes is that? I can't see. Five? Okay, I'll take three minutes in for the video very quickly and then I'll sum up. Five hundred more international content in Hana per heat would generate less electricity. But here's the crazy part. This fire behind me doesn't even hurt the environment. When you burn trash, it generates toxic smoke like this one. And these guys filter out the smoke in a complicated process to make it so clean, cleaner than the air around you. So this chimney at an incineration plant emits clean air. The air coming from the chimney is smaller than one micro, which is very, very clean. By now, 90% of the trash disappears in a couple of hours and the remaining Special 
water that doesn't touch the ocean water. And there, ash stays underwater forever, hidden from everyone. This process is so easy that corals are still alive, the jungles are still green, and the animals are still around at that island. In other words, Singapore collects trash, burns it, creates electricity, filters out the smoke, hides the ashes underwater, and makes this trash bag disappear in one day instead of 500 years. Okay. So the reason I share this is it's a perfect example, a very good example of what I was trying to highlight. Very different solutioning, different approach, and holistic. Do you see the pride those gentlemen were showing? Uh, there's no woman, so that's not good in terms of diversity. But <laughs> do you see how, how proud they are, right? So dignity, I was saying just now, the confidence. After all, they're just dealing with garbage. Why should they be proud of it? <laughs> right. So, yeah, and, and how, you know, it's not just about, well, we don't want to use plastic. I mean, lace, you know, can still use their, their containers, right? Businesses are not affected. People don't lose jobs. But then they find a good solution. And I didn't know that garbage was actually the, the energy behind the beautiful lights in Singapore, right? So, that. And, and the environment is not hurt. So that's an example. Now, very quickly, I want to, I want to give you some examples of what we're pursuing in Maybank, where it's different, where I've been asked, are you allowed to do something like that? The governance part, right? Uh, in, in Maybank, for example, we allow staff to have um, two or three employments. Okay? So they can opt to flex in or flex out. Um, a lot of bankers... Um, Deep, deep down are bakers at heart, right? They, they took the banking job because that's what their parents told them to do. Again, society, right? Mindsets, right? Um, so we've, we've said to them, you can flex out. We need your skills. You, you, you contribute to equivalent of three, three days per week as a banker. The rest of the days, we make you a customer. We have SME business, after all, expertise. We're supposed to have it. So we help these people start their, their businesses. Now, that is a probable solution until we find a better solution to ensuring that our people can have a minimum income of 6000 a month. I'm not even talking about 2000 or 4000 right? We cannot, I mean, because, of course, we, we have stakeholders to answer to, so PBT per staff cost, revenue per staff, we, we monitor that, and we, we, at this stage, cannot pay them 6000 but we want them to have 6000 This is a solution. Right? Now, initially, yes, governance, people threw me everything from governance to, are you allowed to do that? Is it legal? Well, there's nothing illegal about it. There's no law against it. Right? Um, and there is good governance because people who've opted to take the three-day work weeks, for example, I have seen how they've transformed into these wonderful beings again who is alive. Previously, they were zombies. Right? Because they come to work at, at 7 a.m. and then they go back at 10 p.m. and they come back again tomorrow morning and they're robotic. They cause a lot of problems. Customers say they don't listen, right? Uh, stuff like that. So those are all problems that organizations, right from Wall Street down to anywhere else. I'm, I'm a global HR50 person. So I, I, I have colleagues in, in New York, in, in London, you know, who I know are pursuing the same old solutions. So this is not just a Malaysia thing. It's all everywhere. Everywhere we need to look for new solutions. So um, that's just one example. If we have time and you want to know more, I can tell you about uh, others that we are experimenting. It's about experimenting. Because when you talk about IR4.0, let's not just talk, because everything that we should know, we know. Okay? We already know. So what, what I am interested in and what you should be interested in is what is everybody trying right now? Right? In terms of something different. Okay, thank you. The first thing she mentioned is about the external environment. Of course, we heard, I, I was at the Suranjaya Tanaga meeting yesterday. Everybody was sending me WhatsApp. 
uh, brace for tough times. Joe must, Joe must talk. Uh, so filled up my handphone with that. Then she went on to discuss um, 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 aspects to do minimum wage and what people look for, and followed that with um, uh, managing change, um, how one adapts and so on. Uh, well, I'm presenting exactly what she said. It may not necessarily touch on the on the theme. Uh, let me now come back to um, the final speaker. I believe, given that the World Bank have done extent, uh, does extensive surveys on not just um, uh, human capital in the different uh, categories in a country, but also talent, uh, the way talent is attracted and how they're promoted. I know the standard position they take. Um, perhaps maybe we can hear something about it. Please, um, um, Dr. Richard Rackhorn. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Um, let me share a, a little bit of the work that we've been doing in the World Bank around human capital. Um, actually, the, the work has been inspired and led by uh, Paul Romer, who you mentioned, Professor, who was previously our chief economist, and led something that we called the, the Human Capital Project in the World Bank, of which out dropped the, the Human Capital Index. Uh, and we've done a little bit of work that I can hopefully share here on, on Malaysia, but it's really just the starting point for hopefully a lot more work, a lot more discussion and, uh, and insights. Um, and, and it starts from the perspective as well, what would it take for Malaysia to become an inclusive high-income developed economy, one where, where, which is characterized by, by shared prosperity. And when we look backwards in terms of Malaysia's economic growth over the past, you see that investments in human capital have played a very significant role in, in Malaysia's growth, growth, as well as in many other economies in, in this part of the world, which have achieved sustainable economic growth, transformed over, over many decades. But when we look forward to the future, and I think both of my, the previous two speakers on the panel talked a lot about the types of skills, talent, and human capital that all economies, including Malaysia, will need in the future, you can see that the link is becoming even more powerful between a country's economic growth and its human capital, namely the skills, the knowledge, and, and the, health, the underlying health of a country's population. And certainly, I've, I've been in Malaysia two years now. It's not very long to, to really understand Malaysia. Um, it's long enough to know that Malaysia has an enormous abundance of talent, of human capital, but there's also this persistent sense that maybe the aspirations of, I think, Malaysia and Malaysians is, are, are not quite being met with the education system at large, and maybe there are some, some gaps that need to be filled, and perhaps that points to the, the imperative of reform and, and uh, avoiding the insanity that uh, one of my previous spoke, uh, speakers mentioned. So let me introduce what in a nutshell, in, or in one schematic, if you like, how, how this human capital index works. Um, essentially, it's a composite index which measures a child's experience, including survival, schooling, and health. Um, and then, based on those, we can estimate for a child born today what their productivity would be and income as an adult relative to their potential. Um, of course, like any index, it involves a lot of compromises, a lot of assumptions, uh, a simplifying framework. But we do think it's, it's a useful one. Uh, as one piece of trying to understand what the education and the human capital talent puzzle that Malaysia is. Uh, and so perhaps starting off on those, that first bubble, if you like, survival, um, this is the fraction of children who survive to at least age five. Now, for Malaysia, this is 99%, almost 100%. Um, in many countries around the world where the World Bank is supporting much poorer countries, this is the big fundamental challenge around, uh, around disease and, and health systems. Um, Less of an issue for, for Malaysia that, in that first column, but the second and the third are where we, see, where we see some challenges. So let me first talk a little bit about education. And here we, we break down the, the education part of the index into two buckets of indicators, if you like. Um, one is the years of schooling, and one is the, the quality of schooling. Now, a, a child born today in Malaysia can, on average, um, expect to complete about 12.2 years of be basic education including preschooling. However, one of the, the innovations that we try to do with this human capital index is to adjust the years of education for how much learning actually takes place. Um, and this is one of the things that we find around the world. Many of us talk about education, uh, thinking that means everything, but actually there's a big difference between education and learning. Um, 20, 30 years ago, the challenge in many countries around the world was getting children into school. That's actually no longer much of an issue, but we see that there's still a major learning problem throughout many countries around the world. 
And what we find that when we make this adjustment in Malaysia, we find that those 12.2 years of education are equivalent to about 9.1 years of education compared to the highest performing education systems. Korea is one, Singapore is another. I mean, there are several countries like Estonia as well performs very highly. So it gives what we call, as you can see there, a learning gap of about 3.1 years. Um, and essentially perhaps gives us uh, an idea of the, the opportunity to improve if that gap could be closed. And perhaps one thing I, I, I should mention is we'll have a chance to revisit these figures when the new PISA scores for Malaysia come out at the end of 2018 uh, and perhaps get a, a better sense of how, how the, uh, the implementation of the Malaysia Education Blueprint is, is, uh, is proceeding. The second one is nutrition. And many people, including me, think, oh, Malaysia nutrition, that can't be a problem. Surely that's, you know, again, a challenge that much poorer countries and less developed countries face compared to Malaysia. Um, all of those dots, if you like, are countries around the world. On the horizontal axis, you'll see per capita income. Um, and on the vertical axis, you'll see the percentage of children who are not stunted. Um, for Malaysia, that's 79%. Uh, and if you can see there, perhaps not so easy with the colors, there's a line of best fit. Um, and Malaysia is, is well below that line of best fit. Certainly what you find is if you compare that certainly on average, much wealthier countries do better on this measure. Uh, and Malaysia is well below where we would expect for a country of this level of development. So why does it matter? Well, if we're worried about learning, less about education, about learning, then stunting is a key marker of malnutrition. And the brain of a child who is not fully nutrition, uh, nourished will not form the same web of neural connections that are needed for cognitive development, struggle to learn at school, increase the risk or probability of dropping out of school, and getting a good job as an adult. Um, and one thing that surprised us significantly in Malaysia is the assumption is, well, OK, that 20% of Malaysians who are, who are not fully nourished, they must be in the, the most remote, the poorest parts of Malaysia. We start thinking of you know, parts of Sabah, Sarawak. Actually, we find there's a worrying distribution of malnutrition right across Malaysia. In fact, Putrajaya has, I think, the fourth highest rate of stunting of all territories in states in Malaysia, which suggests it's not about availability of food, but more about, again, going back to that original education and quality of food and quality of, of nutrition uh, for children. So how does it all come together? Well, one of the things, unfortunately, the World Bank quite likes doing is making indexes and, and ordering countries. And again, it's, it's always a simplifying framework. It's not everything, but it's one thing to think about as, uh, as we try to understand Malaysia's human capital opportunity and challenges. We put it all together. We see Malaysia has a score of 0.62 on this human capital index for Malaysia. Um, that ranks about 55 out of 157 countries. Um, of course, the score is better than the average for East Asia and Pacific. But then, of course, you know, Malaysia is the, uh, the upper level of income compared to other countries in East Asia and Pacific. Uh, and in fact, Malaysia scores better than the average for other upper middle income economies. But as we know, Malaysia aspires to, to compete with the best, to be the best. Uh, and certainly, in the next few years, Malaysia will likely transition into that high income category. And perhaps that's where the, the sorts of uh, comparators, or, sorry, benchmark economies that Malaysia should be looking to compete against uh, should, should be measured. One way of interpreting the number is to read that uh, essentially that the average Malaysian child, in the absence of renewed reform efforts on human capital, will only reach, at the moment, about 62% of their potential in terms of productivity and lifetime income. So what does it mean? Well, again, I would say we're, we're at the early stages of an analysis. We've tried to pull together some of the numbers, and we're really hoping to discuss with, with many of you and many others about what does it mean and what the type of priorities could be done to try and adjust and, and fill some of the, those gaps. Um, we put them in three main areas, learning, uh, stunting, and safety nets. Certainly, there seems to be a, a challenge with enhancing learning. One of the areas, when you look in a little bit more detail, where Malaysia seems to fall down more than we would expect um, is in the, the quality of, of preschool. Uh, and while Malaysia carries out a large amount of assessments, there doesn't always seem to be the best mechanism and feedback and use in those assessments to then make changes in, in curriculum and teaching and learning methods. Secondly, in stunting, this is uh, still something of a puzzle for us. Again, it's not it's correlated, but only just with income, which suggests it's, it's a much more complex issue uh, and one will re require careful uh, intervention in the future, again, to try and close that gap and reduce the risk of lost potential. And finally, in, in social safety nets. 
We always say it's one thing to invest in human capital, but it's also important to protect human capital and talent. Um, again, Malaysia has a very thin social safety net system. So when we see when households or families experience economic shocks, be it loss of employment, loss of livelihoods, illness, um, without an effective social safety net, it's often uh, very quick to see losses in human capital, which are very hard to recover in the future. So I've just wanted to present a few highlights in that area. Um, we have a recent report, which you can download there, which has a little bit more detail. Or if you're really interested, just Google World Bank Human Capital, uh, and you'll find the entire data set for all countries of the world, including Malaysia, the various dimensions. You can run your own simulations. You can imagine what would happen if Malaysia had Korea's education system, or Singapore's nu uh, nutrition system, or Estonia, or any other country in the world, and see what would it take to change the level of human capital potential in Malaysia, and what might that mean in the future. Of course, what it doesn't tell you is what do we need to, to get there, which is a little bit more complicated and hard. We're trying to work a little bit more on that. Um, and again, we'd love to hear some more in terms of your, your insights and thoughts in the future. Thank you very much. I'd like to mention a few things in the context of how perhaps the, the delegates here would pose questions. It's interesting that um, Dr. Record presented as an account uh, coming from last year's Nobel laureate, uh, Paul Roman, who shared the prize with uh, Bill Nordhaus. Uh, both of them use central computable general equilibrium models, one to endogenize technology and the other how uh, economists can decarbonize the economy. Uh, and in that way, if you impose a carbon tax over the next 100 years, you could possibly cap the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. William Nordhaus is, of course, from, uh, from MIT. Uh, Paul Romo was a student of uh, Robert Solo. <laughs> now, that's, that's the aspect of argument that one needs to contrast, I think. Um, if you look at the work of um, those guys who work on industry policy, that's one. The second is the emerging work, although she didn't take a stand, which is Annalise Sextanian's work about talent. Uh, Annalise Sextanian was at UC Berkeley now. Uh, the two famous books of her, Regional Advantage, actually talks about how Employees start in firms, acquire uh, knowledge, both experiential as well as passages beyond Kenneth Arrow's notion of learning by doing, and then going out to start new firms or working for new firms in the Silicon Valley and, and, and Route 1 to 8. Then she extended that in 2006 to the new Argonauts, talked about how they go back to their own countries to root technical change, to quicken back in Taiwan, Korea, China, and India. Uh, now, that actually includes aspects that are tested. In other words, state government in those countries not just allowed this no, uh, natural classification that Malaysia has. If you have these categories, you can apply for this talent, you can come under the brain game program. I came back under that program, but probably one who hasn't contributed anything. <laughs> now, the second one is you target industries, um, and then you look at those guys who moved up to big organizations like Maurice Chang, who became senior vice president of Texas Instruments. He not only studied at UC Berkeley, he worked at IBM, went on, he was connected to labs, he was connected to pools of talent, market, buyer supply relationships. So he actually went to Texas and included a whole network going back and spawning log, um, uh, CSMC, which became the world leading firm in logistics. Uh, now, that aspect of it normally doesn't come out here. And the reason I say that is also because, and I have an ally here in the neoclassical economist, Bob Lucas, who himself is a mathematical economist, he says you can't possibly use the Granger causality test and just claim that this direction is, is, is causality causing that because of the, so many aspects of things going there. Now, I'm sorry I, I dragged this to something abstract for those who are not so familiar with this, but I, I'm sure some of you may be interested in questions in relation to broad macro policy as to what government should do. Um, I think we should allow 20 minutes, and I'm sorry, uh, um, somehow timekeeping has got, gone out of hand. I can't be blamed for it. We had this <laughs> control over it. Questions, please. Unless there are no questions, then we... I, I have uh, um, a question each to the earlier two speakers. Uh, I'll come to Richard perhaps uh, in a bit, <laughs> if we have time. My first question is to Dato E, Dato Edmunds Berkeley. To what extent do you think that tertiary education can impact talent uh, um, development, or as Richard put it, as the human capital type of uh, investment? Yeah? Because we have primary, secondary, and, and there are varying views about uh, which level of education would impact on the talent development much, much, or 
that we need for the country. My uh, second question is to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Nora. Um, from your experience in, in Mayban, what are the kind of uh, skills or, or the kind of individuals, how do you put it, the kind of competencies that you look for uh, for new recruits? Yeah, what is it that you're looking for so that for us who are coming from universities, we know um, what extra things we should do uh, in, in um, developing uh, students? Yeah, thank you. Um, I want, in answering your question, I would also want to address what uh, uh, Prof. Raja Rasia was, was talking about earlier, which is this thing on STEM education. I know that uh, we have been placing a lot of emphasis on uh, science and technology, and in fact, the minister is now calling it stream, even, you know, one, uh, having added in the arts and having added in. Um, the R is supposed to be reading, but the whole idea is, is to be more well-read and, and to be more well-rounded, I suppose. And I, I like the way the minister has put it that way, in fact, because um, you can become so technical and you can become uh, so scientific. We, we know that we need the basics and we know that we need science to, to help you to create uh, um, you know, uh, new inventions, etc. And, and that is important. But I wanted to go back to the fact that we are losing the person in, in, in all this scientific learning as well. Uh, and that was what I was going on about the common, common sense and all that. You can teach sciences in the classroom, but we are now forcing things like moral education. We are forcing values and and using them as, as separate uh, units to be taught. You, you can't do that. It has to be part of the whole um, curriculum. You must be infused in the way you teach. It must be infused in, 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 in the way you um, engage with, with your students so that they don't become robots because uh, machines will do a better job at that in time to come and they're going to take over. But the people that we need to equip now at university are people who know how to think, who know how to create new knowledge, who are um, able to, um, we talk about the multiple intelligences, have we honed the multiple intelligences or are we just on IQ alone and trying to, to just uh, uh, push on intelligence, whereas um, there, there is so much more. Um, that, that we know, the arts, the music, etc., the creativity, because that is what is going to distinguish us between us and the machines which will take over our job in time to come, so that we can be uh, at a higher level. And so, when you ask me that question, it sounds very philosophical, but yet, at the same time, it's so important. I was so heartened to learn that my own daughter, um, while taking up computer science as her major, she's also take, taking up, taken up or rather philosophy. And, and that makes her so much more special. And now that she's going on for internship, everyone wants her. I think it's not so much for her great personality. I mean, she's, she's just like any young girl. But it's also that she's able to bring the other part, the thinking part of her into the sciences. So um, that, that, that is how I'd like to address your question. Thank you. I totally agree with Dr. Elizabeth. Uh, thank you, Prof. Dr. Dr. Uh, Noma. Um, in fact, my son, so Elizabeth talks about her daughter. My son is a very left-brained maths person, but I've asked him to take anthropology. And that something is, is potent. You know? So um, now, a few months ago, I was invited by MIA to address a hall full of young accountants. Okay. Um, one of the first questions I asked them was, what percentage of the time um, do you spend pooling data and 
producing a bunch of things. Okay? Now, before the hall could answer, the previous chairman, uh, president of MIA, who was seated right in front, he answered. He said, at least 80%. And I went, well then, and I'm not surprised I was expecting that kind of answer. Then be prepared. You will lose your job. Now, because as Elizabeth, as Dr. Elizabeth said, we will RPA, we will robotize, and we will IA, if you like, right? The production of financial statements, even to the first and second level of analytics. So, what do accountants do in future? Or oh, future is today, by the way. Future is now, right? So, my answer to that question is really the solutioning, and that's how I was, I was talking about things like that. Looking at data-driven decision making, data-driven planning. That is what we need. So, you know, we are swimming and drowning in data. How much of that data are we using? Okay. So that is the, the change in terms of you know, what, what to teach and how to teach. Um, an example I gave, uh, again, in, in Maybank is when I went back to, you know, after talking to a, a, a group of people uh, in, in a conference and I, w I wasn't happy with the responses I was getting and I went back and I said, I'm, we're going to be doing something about this. And I told my team, I said, I'm disallowing any more classes at the academy that deals with introduction. Introduction in credit, introduction in whatever. Right, basic. Because nowadays you can just Google and whatever you get, and I, I did a test myself. That was, this was a few years ago. I Googled credit evaluation decision. Okay? Everything that came out are all the, the information that we give to our students or our, our you know, whoever who came to the academy um, over a one week equivalent program. Now that's a total waste of time. So the, the change is, you know, give the person these links, get them to understand it. When you actually come to class, we do scenarios, we do case studies, we, you know, we, we teach them how to make decisions based on their analysis. Okay? Um, regression. It's a powerful tool that nobody taught the students how to use it at the workplace. So we, we actually brought our, our, our you know, uh, analysts to, to class and just refresh their memories. And what, you know, our people are doing more targeted sales right now, just by you know, using the, the tools that you and I study in college, that we never used in the workplace, right? Um, our success rate, of conversion for sales, tar targeted sales, right, is 1.5 times higher today because they were not, they are not no longer using shotgun approach, right? Very targeted. So those, those are the what's required to be happening in the the classrooms in the university. I was asked to to go in and talk to um, PhD students of the University of Malaya, right? And my class was at 11. I asked them what were they doing in the morning, and I went, oh my god. What you were spending three hours on earlier today, we, don't, we no longer need it in company. <laughs> right? So you've just wasted your time. So, yeah. Now, um, so what do we look for? I look for problem solvers. I have more than enough people who talk about all the issues, <laughs> right? If there is a leak in the room, everybody's going to say, oh, there's a leak in the room. <laughs> and then nothing. I look for the person who runs off trying to look for a container because it's spoiling the carpet and puts it under the, 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 the leak, right? Hired immediately, no interview. Because, you know, the world is so full of people who, who talk about issues, but they, they don't solve it. So I'm, I'm just alluding to, these are practical stuff. I'm a practical person. <laughs> and these are things that we look for. 
And um, right now, uh, we are in Indonesia. We, we go on our milk runs um, at all ASEAN countries. We do it in the UK as well. Um, we, we actually look for people through physical gamification. Okay? It's called the Maybank Go Ahead Challenge. This is where we, we actually observe the, the graduate. Now, in, in Maybank, and this, uh, you know, unless they're doing it behind my back, I have abolished things like you know, looking for a particular G CGPA, right? Because I have not seen any direct link to a high G CGPA with a high performer in the, in the company. Why would I then turn, turn away people with, you know, who's got a degree? I trust the faculties. I, I trust the universities. When you say someone's graduated, someone's graduated, fine. The person's got the passport, right? Now I want to see what the person can do in the workplace. And the CGPA doesn't tell me very much. Likewise for, for you know, hiring of um, uh, middle to, to uh, senior uh, positions. I've abolished things like minimum, let's say we're hiring a, a, a credit manager, a uh, credit card manager, uh, minimum 10 years credit card experience. What the heck does that mean? Right? Nobody can explain to me. What if the person has been doing 10 years of just looking at credit cards and putting it in envelopes? <laughs> right? So, you know, that's a duh. And I have a brilliant person, all right, with good track record, high learning agility, absolutely no credit card experience, who can, within two months, you know, understand the, the intricacies of credit card. I mean, it's a product anyway. Right? So, those are what I mean by really looking at things differently, really, you know, looking at different ways to govern, govern um, and, and that's what we're doing. Now, for um, our internal people, I hope you, you did read, early last year, we launched our Maybank Future Ready Skilling, uh, a reskilling program. Uh, so, and that's compulsory. Uh, what we're trying to do is make sure people are truly digital literate. And digital literacy is just like literate in English. Right? Those days, we said to, for Malaysia, Malaysians to be able to compete in a global platform, we need to be able to speak English. Lah, right? Just speak. Lah. We don't need Queen, Queen's English. Okay? But you need to understand because the books, the, you know, the, 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 the literature that's required are all in English. Now, this, this time, it's no longer English. It's, well, it is English, but on top of that, it's digital literacy. What does that mean? It's not just saying, yeah, yeah, of course I know Bitcoin. Of course I know uh, uh, what AI is. But do you understand what it means? Do you understand the implications? That is what Maybank Future Ready Reskilling is all about. So we make sure our people are digital literate. And then we make sure they, they are equipped to be able to truly leverage on the existing tools that the second order of the internet is giving mankind, you and I and truly leverage on it, okay? Um, and, and that's why we have a program called the Maybank Go Ahead, Take Charge. And there are four pillars. I alluded to it just now. There's flex in, flex out. There's entrepreneurship. I've got bankers whom, you know, we've, we've actually uh, uh, moved into very, very successful entrepreneurs, right? Uh, but it requires hard work because they dare not, they dare not, you know, take, take the step because society will look at them as if they are bums, if, if they go from a banker to an entrepreneur, right? So we, we've had to also help the person uh, uh, deal with, it, with, with, with their families and so forth. Really looking for people, I mean, one example of, of a person we had was, you know, he wasn't doing very well. Um, he was, of course, an average performer, not that he's a non-performer, but then, you know, we, we started talking to him and we discovered that he had inherited a, a, a land, a piece of land, um, and it's, it, it, he's not done anything with it because um, he's busy being a banker. <laughs> and and uh, to cut the story short, today he runs a chili farm. And chilies, you know, are very expensive, right? Um, and he's earning way above what, what he, would, he, would, he was earning as, as a banker with us. Um, he's happy. Right, because that's that's really what he wants to do, uh, and he's at home. So, I'm I'm I know I'm answering more than you're asking, Prof. Uh, Dr. Norma, but I want to make sure that you know the the, the full story is there when, when I say you know when I give my responses. Thank you. I think the chief controller has already made her presence clear, so we're not going to uh, 
keep this session much longer, except for me to put out a few points. I was quite actually impressed with the uh, point that uh, Professor Nora raised about scenario building. It's very much part of foresight planning, uh, something I've been working on since the time I was at Maastricht. Now, let me just give you an example. We launched the smart schools in 1997. And if you look at the smart school, I happen to be in the, in the Java Tank Costa Induk, Dino Penerican Tingi of the uh, Education Ministry since the previous government. Now, all they do is to see that there are enough computers that connect with internet. Now, I also happen to be the chief economist when Vietnam prepared the Industry 4.0. That's why we Ong was mentioning yesterday. I gave him the uh, copy of the report. I was only advising them. Now, they are actually dealing with issues like this. You're not just looking at kids very young, you're catching them to connect with a digitalized infrastructure. But you're building their analytical abilities so that the mind becomes creative. Remember, the only resource, the more you use, the better it becomes the brain. The worst brain to have is a brand new brain. Now, I think once one understands this thing, you can actually connect, get the whole economy engaged we become participative in this process of moving to Industry 4.0. I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Madam. Thank you. I think um, that uh, ends our session for for this seg segment. Um, thank you very much to our speakers. And um, uh, could you please remain on stage because we have a token of appreciation uh, from us, which will be given by uh, our Professor Dr. Raja Nasia.